Larkin Rose is coming to you today. He's, he is a self-described tax heretic, an enemy of the state. He is author of three books, one video, and countless articles, among other things. He is unapologetically and unconditionally committed to ending the federal income tax fraud. And more importantly, to end the underlying entire notion of government and authority. You can visit his website at larkinrose.com. Please welcome to Free Your Mind, Larkin Rose. The title of my talk today is Removing Mental Malware. Uh, malware as in computer malware, where somebody writes a program and sticks it on your computer by way of a virus or something, so that the computer serves him instead of you. It'll be the mental version of that, but I'm going to start in a different direction and we'll, we'll get around to that, because there's a little, got to build a foundation before we get there. Step one is, do you want to know the truth? Now, whenever you ask that to any crowd, people say, yeah. In the vast majority of cases, in the vast majority of crowds, maybe even here, the honest answer is, no, I don't. Because if you really want to know the truth, that requires you to put everything you believe at risk. To question everything you assume, to question everything you think you've already figured out. And that's not easy, and that's not comfortable. And, and I'm not exempting myself from this statement either. I can look back on my life and see lots and lots of cases where I actively resisted the truth because I was comfortable in a lie, in a whole bunch of lies. Uh, and I want, I'll use the example, if you picture a, a globe, a map of the whole world, and you color code it by religions, so you have, over here, vast majority are Christian. Over here, vast majority are Muslim. Over here, vast majority are Jewish. Vast majority are this, that, the other thing. And these giant pockets of color. Now, are we to believe that it's just by coincidence that everybody started by being objective and rational and thought things out carefully, and golly gee, just by coincidence, this giant group of people came to one conclusion, and this giant group of people came to another conclusion. No, it's because we believe what we're taught. We, we believe what we hear everyone around us telling us, what our teachers tell us, what our parents tell us, um, what the community around us tells us. The question of do you want to know the truth applies to, to every religious group, every field of science, every type of personality. It's always a challenge and it's always uncomfortable to consider the possibility that your paradigms are completely bogus. And it goes in every direction for everybody. I mean, you may have some, some pet theory, some conspiracy theory, or some weird theory that other people think are weird. And if you found out the truth, you might find you were actually wrong. That your theory was bogus. And if you are not open to that possibility, then you're not really going for the truth. On the other hand, there may be somebody who says, well, I believe what the mainstream believes, and I believe what everyone around me believes, and I'm not going to consider anything that sounds unusual or weird. They don't want to know the truth either. Wanting to know the truth requires risking what you already have and what you're already comfortable with, which is why most people don't want to know the truth. And it really takes an active effort to go out of your way to take whatever you already believe Put it to the side and say, if I was right, if it was already true, then I can doubt that right and left all over the place and put it to the test constantly, it will still end up being true. It is only when you're not really sure that you don't dare to put it to the test, because it might fall apart. So, the first step is, do you want to know the truth? And that is a giant question that almost everybody says yeah to. And it's hardly ever true for anybody, including me. It takes an active effort 
to dare to question what you already think you know. Assuming you actually want to know the truth, how do you get there? By using the scientific method or the scientific process. Now, I'm a huge fan of the scientific process. I think it's the only way to reach rational conclusions. However, I'm also a huge critic of a lot of people who stick the label scientist on themselves. The scientific process, in a nutshell, I'm sure you guys all know this anyway, is you take in evidence, you take in data, and from it you try to extrapolate an explanation of reality, or little pieces of reality. You try to get a worldview that actually matches the world outside of you. And sometimes you find out, whoops, well, that data made it look like this, but now this data makes it... And so you have to test your theories and sometimes throw them out. Now, a lot of people who wear the label scientists and pretend they like science, what they do is take in a lot of evidence, look at the stuff that already fits what they already believe, and the other stuff, that's just weird. We're, we're going to pretend that didn't happen. Uh, and it's, it's always funny to me how many people have had some sort of experience, you know, the whole array, and a lot of them have been talked about this weekend, some sort of experience that doesn't fit in the sort of standard, accepted, materialistic view of reality. Well, we're all just physical machines, and we all have everything pretty much figured out. And I'm pretty sure it's a pretty big majority of the people have personal experiences that don't really fit that, that there's something else weird going on. And a lot of people who call themselves scientists throw that out the window and say, well, we don't really need that data because it doesn't fit our foregone conclusion. So by the scientific process, I don't mean come to the results that are now usually labeled under science. I mean the actual scientific process of look at the world, take in all the evidence you can, and then try to figure out uh, reality from that. Even if the evidence is weird and disturbing and and goes against what you already want. Now, another pro problem with people using the scientific process, or something that stops people from using it, is when it starts to point at a conclusion that they don't like, they will often bail out. No, that, that, that's wrong. And, and this happens in all directions. Um, like I said about wanting to know the truth, if you start to see a rational examination of the evidence pointing towards you were totally wrong about something, most people will bail out and run the other way. And because they're invested in what they already believe in. Now this is especially true if it's something you've, you've believed in your whole life, you've worked on, maybe if you've devoted your career to something and somebody comes along and says, I want you to consider this and rationally look at the evidence and find out that your entire career was based on a gigantic lie. There is a huge uh, motivation to not look at that, to not use the scientific process. <laughs> That's what we have to, each one of us has to look out for inside our own heads. Are there any walls we put up because we think, you know, I don't really like where that evidence and logic is leading me, I'm just going to kind of stick a wall there and pretend I didn't see that. Uh, that's the comfortable, easy thing. And, and I see it myself, and I see it in everybody else. It's, it's perfectly natural to want to do that because we're comfortable thinking we already understand reality. So we stick up a wall in front of it, anything that kind of messes with our, with our assumptions. And as I said, there are lots of conclusions people don't want to reach. Um, there are lots and lots of conspiracy theories. And when people say conspiracy theory, they're usually bashing it, and what they usually mean is, I don't want to consider the possibility that the explanation for this event that happened is something that's really going to creep me out. So I'm going to call it a conspiracy theory. That is not scientific and that is not rational. And when you have things happen like what happened in Boston and 9-11, I don't even bother telling people what I think very often, or, or arguing the evidence, I just go to people and say, do you look at this evidence, did you approach this wanting to know what happened, or did you approach this determined that this will be the conclusion you reach no matter what? And that's most people, because most people don't want to know the truth. If the truth is horrible and scary, do you want to know it? If the truth is nice and pleasant, do you want to know it? 
If we don't put loyalty to the truth above everything, above our own comfort, above what we always thought, above what we may have invested our lives in, then we're just the mental inertia that holds humanity back. And the only people who ever move it forward are the ones who say, yeah, I want to know the whole truth. It might be unpleasant and it might totally mess up my view of the world and might mess up my life and everything else, but uh, yeah, truth's got to come first. Those are the only people who ever move the world in the right directions. Now, assuming we want to know the truth and assuming we know the scientific process, why do we come to so many different conclusions? What messes things up for us? I want to talk for a second about checking for warped perceptions. Uh, I'm just going to assert here that the primary problem in the world is not greed, and it is not hatred, and it is not malice. It's the fact that people's perception of reality is hugely twisted by things they're taught, by things they hear all around them, uh, by their upbringing. And a, 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 an example I love to use is if you went to any war, there's a battlefield going on, people are blowing people up right and left, and you call time out, and for some reason they paid attention to you and they all stopped. And you walk over to one side, doesn't matter which side, and you say, I I'm just checking because I'm new around here, uh, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? Never will you go to one side and have them say, yeah, we're the bad guys. <laughs> They will say, we're the good guys, we're fighting for truth and justice, and those guys are trying to ruin the world. And if you went and asked them, they'd say the exact same thing. Neither side would say, yeah, we're trying to do bad stuff. We want evil to prevail. Nobody ever says that in any war ever. Now, I think it's pretty self-evident that if you have one huge group of people who means well and wants truth and justice to prevail and sees reality as it is, and another huge group of people who wants truth and justice to prevail, and they see reality as it is, they probably wouldn't be trying to murder each other. Which means the underlying problem in every war is not the hatred, even though there's obvious you know, surface animosity while they're trying to kill each other. It's warping of perceptions. At least one side and I would say both sides every time, their perceptions have been warped such that they think trying to kill that other guy is necessary for humanity. And the guy over there thinks trying to kill them is necessary for humanity. And if the one side or both sides whose perceptions were mangled could fix their own perceptions, the war stops. Because they suddenly realize, okay, you think you're the good guy and I think I'm the good guy. If we both understand reality, we'll probably stop killing each other. The problem is, uh, this is something I refer to as mental lenses. Things that are inside our head that warp the way we see the world. Now, everybody thinks he sees the world as it is. Everybody. It, it's impossible not to. You think you see reality, you think you have a pretty good grip on reality. There, there may be things you say, well, I don't know about this and I don't know about that, but I have a general grasp on what's going on. Nobody thinks his own perception is messed up. Now, everybody can point to all sorts of other people and say, his, his perception is messed up. He doesn't know what's going on. That guy's delusional. But me, no, I, I'm, I know, I know, I'm in the know. Everybody thinks that. And pointing out that somebody else is delusional doesn't make them not delusional, even if they are. The only thing that moves humanity forward is if somebody dares to look inside their own head and say, are there things that are messing up my perception of reality and making me do stupid stuff? Because the only one you can actually change is yourself. And unfortunately, most people would much rather shoot at other people than say, maybe my belief system is based on some bogus ideas. So for the past 10,000 years or whatever, we've just been killing each other because, you know, I'd rather kill you than think about my own paradigm. Not a good situation, but it is changing with events like this, among other things. Now, the question is, why would our perceptions be warped? I'm going to start with the, the accidental non-malicious version. Um, 
When I talk about mental malware, I mean stuff that was put there intentionally to mess you up. But I'm going to start with the stuff that's just accidental. Because most of what we believe is passed on to us from our, from our parents, our teachers, our friends, people around us, our society as a whole, the media, all the things we're exposed to. I do not believe that everybody out there telling a lie is trying to tell a lie. I believe the vast majority are just passing on lies that they were taught because they don't know any better. When parents teach their children stupid things that they learn, they're not thinking, ha ha, I'm gonna get my kids to this one. They think they're the same reality to the next generation. When teachers teach the same garbage that they were taught that's untrue and based on a bunch of false paradigms, they're not trying to be nasty, they're just passing on their own misunderstanding. And this is why, number one, is important, we have to want to know the truth. Because if someone who cares about you and loves you is telling you this and they sound so sure of themselves, the hardest thing in the world is to think, well, you know, maybe you're totally wrong, Mom and Dad. You know, I know you mean well, I don't think you're trying to fake me out, but I think you and everyone around me might be totally wrong about this. And that's a really uncomfortable position to be in. Uh, another reason people don't want the truth is if you're the only one who believes something, it's really uncomfortable. And I suspect people in this crowd know that a lot more than the general public. Not being in the majority is an uncomfortable place to be, which tends to push us into a majority that all can feel confident that together they believe the wrong destructive things. So, there are lots of accidental ways we pass on misperception and we, we mangle the way we see the world. Uh, now, I happen to think there is a huge intentional effort to it. For the purpose of this talk, it actually doesn't matter that much whether it's intentional or not. What matters is getting it out of your head. Um, those of you who know about the, the Prussian indoctrination system um, and like John Taylor Gatto's work, you can very much see the intentional, the openly admitted intentional design of programming people to be easily controlled and, and unthinking, basically machines. But again, for the purposes of this talk, it doesn't even matter if it, if you got it, if you got these warped perceptions by way of misinformed but benevolent sources or actual psychos trying to control you. Because either way, if they're stuck in, in your head and messing with your perception, then they need to be fixed. And, and I will say this, a lot of people say, oh, you think it's somebody's trying to control us. If I was a sociopath, I would, I would focus heavily on propaganda and mind control. And any sociopath worth his salt would. Because if you can control people mentally, you don't have to control them with violence. And so the idea that they would never do that, well, there are bad people in the world and they would totally do that. Um, Frankly, I don't think that they're even doing a very good job recently, which I'm happy about. But uh, again, ultimately, for now, it doesn't matter how the warped perceptions got there. Now, the primary example of malware that I talk about all over the place in all sorts of videos and, and books, the main thing I focus on is the malware revolving around concepts of government and law, and politics, and authority, and crime, and all the terminology, and all the thought processes that, like, tentacles come out from the belief in authority. Now, it's, it's really easy to point to some bad guy, to point to some tyrant, to point to some regime, and say, that's the problem, they're scary, they're bad, let's go do something about them. Uh, but my main focus is the fact that the main problem isn't the bad guys. The bad guys will keep being bad guys. The main problem is the power they get from the warping of the perceptions of their victims. And if you fix the perception of their victims, the control freaks don't have any power anymore. And if you just want, like the, the last talk I gave at, at the first... Uh, Free Your Mind conference, where I, I did the thing of, of talking to an alien. An alien comes to, to Earth, and some Earthling is trying to explain to the alien what government is. Well, is it the building? Well, no, it's not the building. That's just a building. 
Well, is it the people inside? Well, not exactly. Is it the law books? Well, no. It's sort of this mystical, magical entity. Everybody, not everybody, almost everybody believes in government. They believe it's real. They believe in the law. They believe in authority. And they have all these perceptions that they think are based on reality. And this is a huge example of what I mean by checking for mental malware. And the key is to observe how your own brain reacts to, to ideas. Now, if you can rationally take in evidence and ideas and analyze them and explain your position, whether or not you end up agreeing with me or any, agreeing with anybody else, fine, that's the rational process. But if you keep an eye on your own brain, and when you're exposed to things that challenge your paradigms and challenge your perceptions, like in a big way, Watch if your brain reacts by saying, well, here's an explanation, or reacts by going, ah, no, that can't be true, go away. Because what I did, and what almost everybody I know did when first faced with the reality of the belief in government is, no, we have to have government go away, I don't have anymore. That is a dead giveaway that there's malware in your head. Because, it, whatever, like I said before, whatever you believe, if it's true, you can put it to the test all you want. You can doubt it all you want. You can come at it at every possible angle. What's true is still going to be true. But if your mind shuts down all the incoming information, shuts down the rational process and runs the other way, that's a dead giveaway that you have malware in your head. That there are things stuck in your head that are interfering with your brain functioning the way your brain is supposed to function. Being able to take evidence, process it, and figure out conclusions, figure out reality. Now, here's a huge example. A huge example having to do with, with my favorite example of malware, which is political thing. Would you feel guilty breaking a law that didn't hurt anybody? And there are eight zillion, eight zillion examples that could be given. For example, if, if you ask somebody like, do you smoke pot? Now, the question is not, would you be scared of getting arrested? That's perfectly rational. I don't want to be put in a cage, so maybe I won't do that. But would you actually feel guilty? Would you feel guilty smoking a joint, but not drinking a beer? Now, I don't do either one, so I can be an objective referee here. But if you would actually feel guilty because some human beings in a building far, far away wrote down on a piece of paper, you're not allowed to do that one, but you're allowed to do this one, that is a great sign that you have somebody controlling what's in here. If they can actually make you feel bad about something, that isn't in any way morally different from something else you could be doing. Yo, this is okay. I can be proud. I'm a beer-drinking American. I'm not one of those potheads. What's the difference? The only difference is, well, there are a lot of differences all in favor of pot and against alcohol. <laughs> but the only difference people, most people care about is, well, the politicians wrote down, you're not allowed to do that. Now, people don't just perceive that as a threat. Like, if I wrote down, I wouldn't, but if I wrote down, if I catch you smoking pot, I'm going to shoot you in the kneecap. That's just a threat. It wouldn't make you feel guilty. You might be scared if I was anywhere again, that psycho's going to shoot me if he'd see me smoking pot. But you wouldn't feel bad, oh, golly, yeah, disobeyed Larkin. Who cares? But if you're convinced that it's law and it's government and it's authority, literally people feel profound moral guilt at doing something that doesn't hurt anybody but disobeys the group of people who claim to be government, who claim to have the right to rule. And that guilt is a dead giveaway that you have malware in your head. Now, guilt of actually hurting somebody, like if I stole somebody's stuff, I wouldn't. If I stole somebody's stuff, I would feel guilty because I actually hurt them. It isn't because, oh golly, I stole somebody's stuff and those politicians way over there wrote down that I wasn't supposed to. 
That's not a reason to feel guilt. The reason to feel guilt is you did something that hurt, hurt the self-ownership of somebody else. <clears throat> but the guilt at, at breaking the law and the obligation, and, and I, I love the term law-abiding taxpayer because it's people proudly displaying their malware for all the world to see. <laughs> I am proud that I give my money to a bunch of crooks and I do whatever they tell me. <laughs> Law-abiding taxpayer. That is all it means. But lots and lots of good people, genuinely benevolent people, take pride in that because they have malware stuck in their head. And when I bring it up, most people do the, the, the instinctive emotional reaction of, I don't want to think about it because it's really uncomfortable. Because if you, if you make it a personal point to take pride in the fact that you're law-abiding, meaning you do what the politicians tell you, when somebody comes along and says, yeah, that, that doesn't make you good, in fact, kind of makes you one of the ones who's fueling the destruction of mankind. So maybe you should stop being proud about being a law-abiding taxpayer and consider being a criminal tax cheat. <laughs> Amazingly, people don't want to hear that. And, and again, there's the other point of when people obey because they don't want to get tasered or bludgeoned or thrown in a cage. That's perfectly rational. I'm not saying run off and get tasered, tasered and thrown in a cage just for the fun of it. But if you feel the guilt, that's malware and nothing else. And these perceptions come up in all sorts of fields, everything that relates to government. The way people perceive uh, police, a guy with a badge. Two, two people come up to you. One is just a guy off the street says, hey, can I look through your bags? And you say, who are you? No, go away. And the other one says, hey, I have a badge. Can I look through your bags? Most of the country go, sure, I have nothing to hide. Wait a minute, they're both human beings. Why do you respond differently? Because you have malware in your head that tells you that guy isn't just a human being. He has rights that human beings don't. I am obligated to bow and grovel and do whatever he says. And that malware is so omnipresent that when some people don't and say, no, you can't search my car, and no, I have nothing to say to you, and... I'm not even going to tell you if I'm a citizen, it's none of your business. A lot of the other victims say, oh, you're horrible. You should cooperate and do what the, the guy with the badge says. And that is the problem with the malware, because those people are good people. As annoying as they are, and as much as I love to argue with them, they're not saying that because they're evil. They're saying that because they really and truly believe that good people obey authority. And that if you don't, you are therefore bad. And lots and lots of history is good people who are taught to believe the lie of authority, either just spectating and doing nothing, or actively helping to dominate, oppress, or even kill their fellow man because authority told them to. And that's what I mean by the fact that the problem is not the psychos. You know, a thing I often point out is there's only one reason we know the name Adolf Hitler. And it wasn't because of Adolf Hitler. It was because lots and lots and lots and lots of people in Germany believed in the thing called authority. And so if the guy is in a certain position and has a certain job description, and he tells you to do something, well, you do it. You follow orders. You enforce the law. If they didn't believe that, what could one goofball with a stupid mustache possibly have done on his own? Maybe knock off a dozen people before somebody blows his head off. Then we're done. Same thing everywhere. You know, Red China, Soviet Union, you can go anywhere you want. The mass oppression was not because all the individuals doing it thought, you know, today I just want to go hurt somebody. It's because they were raised with the malware of authoritarianism and government and law and all these concepts that go together so that they literally feel guilty about doing what they know is right. Now I often go into a rant about the Milgram experiments. Um, I'm going to skip it this time because I've done a million other times. Um, but Stanley Milgram did experiments which totally show that this applies to Americans as much as anybody else. We know what is right and wrong, and we will do the wrong thing if a perceived authority tells us to. That's the horrendous punchline. 
Um, I highly suggest um, everybody go check out those. It should be required. People should be forced to read that book. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but his uh, Stanley Milgram's book is called Obedience to Authority, and it goes all through his experiments, which is really creepy, but it's an outstanding uh, expose on mental malware and the destruction it leads to uh, making good people do really nasty, evil stuff. And if we, uh, the thing I often say is that if if we only had to deal with the genuinely nasty people who would do nasty stuff on their own, if that's all we had to worry about, this planet would be a lot closer to a utopia than having to deal with good people who do bad stuff because law tells them to, because authority and government tell them to. So apparently you already knew that. <laughs> now, even inside the the, the freedom movement, um, sort of a label that covers a million different kinds of people with a million different agendas, the agenda is so, because the malware is so lodged in most people's heads, even the people, even the vast majority of people say, I want freedom, they don't recognize their own malware. They don't even check for it. Because they think, the problem's in Washington, D.C. Those guys are bad guys. And yeah, they are bad guys, but they're not the problem. And we have to go do something to them. And whenever that's the focus, you lose, because you miss the problem. You miss the underlying problem of the world. The entire idea that we have to do something to the ruling class, whether it's we have to vote in people who will stick by, eh, well, we have to go petition them, eh, well, we have to go have a protest, eh, we have to have a revolution, eh. There is nothing you can do to the control freaks who pretend to be government that will fix reality. Because let's say Washington DC just falls into the ocean tomorrow. What happens? We get a new one. Why? Because 300 million people have the malware in their heads that say we have to have government. As long as that malware is in their heads, it doesn't matter what you do to the current ruling class. Elections and petitions, even revolutions, they're pointless because that isn't the problem. If the problem is inside your head, shooting somebody in Washington isn't going to fix it. And the problem is inside the heads of 300 million Americans. Well, that number is going down, thankfully, and the number of people who escape the mythology is going up. By leaps and bounds, actually. But if you imagine a world in which the malware is gone, and tomorrow 300 million people wake up and say... I don't really feel a need to give a bunch of my money to them. In fact, I don't feel a need to use their crummy currency that keeps going down in value. I don't feel the moral obligation to obey their arbitrary stupid commands, and I definitely don't want to fuel their war machine in their police state. So, eh, nah, nah, nah. Now, if one person does that, out come the jackboots and he gets stomped and killed and thrown in a cage. If 300 million do it, including the jackboots, we're done. The end. <laughs> Even the jackboots do what they do because of malware. Now, uh, I did a video a while ago that got some notoriety um, called When Should You Shoot a Cop? It made national news three times, and people freaked out all over the place. First paragraph says, most people are going to look at the title and freak out and not read this article. And then lots of people went out, freaked out, didn't read the article, proving that the article is true. Um, and I talk about it because that's a, that's a fundamental concept to understand. Now people say, so you're for overthrowing the government. That no, wouldn't do any good. It's either unnecessary when the people get rid of their malware, you can just ignore them out of existence, or it's counterproductive. I mean, we had that nasty King George tyrant, we had a big revolution and lots of people died and we got independence and now we have taxation that's ten times as high and regulation that's a zillion times as high. In the long run, it didn't do anything. It made things worse. 
Because it's one thing to say, that guy on the throne today, I don't like him. Well, what we do, good for you. It's another thing to say, I don't think there should be a throne. I don't think anybody has the right to rule. I think we each own ourselves, and we darn well better learn to coexist as equal sentient beings instead of whining for some guy on a throne, whether it's called a throne or a congress or a parliament, doesn't matter what you call it, maybe we should just be people instead of trying to make an all-powerful state to save the day. So until that fixes, uh, I will say in the short term, I, am, I totally support people forcibly defending themselves against aggression committed in the name of law. It's completely moral. Now, a lot of the time, on a practical level, you might not want to do that because you might end up dead. I'm not saying, oh, just do whatever they say until we change people's minds. I am saying, as long as your focus on, is on doing something to the rulers, nothing fixes because they're not the problem. And all of their power comes from the malware in our heads. Our perceptions that they have the right to do this, that their commands are law, that when they say, give me money, it isn't robbery, it's taxation. These ideas in the heads of the victims are the problem. And until that goes, there's nothing you can do to the current state. You know, history is full of examples of, well, we knocked over this regime, and so for a while they weren't beating us up until we built another one, and then they beat us up. So it can temporarily reduce a particular example of tyranny, but it doesn't ever fix the problem until you get rid of the malware. In fact, it makes the problem worse. And this is the thing I often talk about and, and offend lots of political activists who mean well, and I think their, their heart's in the right place, but they don't recognize the malware inside their own head. When you go in front of a Capitol building and you wave a sign and say, we demand this, what you are actually saying, and the only thing the people inside here is, <laughs> they're asking us to do something. That's all they care about. They don't care what the signs say. All the people inside care about is they're still asking us for permission. <laughs> when they're scared is the day people don't protest, people don't come to the Capitol, they don't even have a revolution, they just ignore them. <laughs> As long as people vote or protest or petition, you know, voting is like, well, we're going to make our voice heard. And it's a little rude, but I often say, if your vote is your voice, then just shut up. <laughs> because your vote doesn't do any good. All it does is say, I agree that whoever's name gets the most buttons pushed next to it has the right to rule it. <laughs> well, just put on a chain and go sit in a cage. Because the problem isn't the guy ruling you, it's that you actually think that that ritual can give someone the right to rule you. Now, my main problem isn't that somebody believes that that can give him the right to rule him. It's that he believes it gives that guy the right to rule me. Now, if you want to go off and be ruled in some S&M relationship, be my freaking guest. <laughs> but don't drag the civilized, rational world into your authoritarian delusions, please. But you'll note they never make that exception. You know, imagine a law. I, 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 you know, law is totally bogus, but I like putting this in front of people. What would you think of this law? Government can only tax, regulate, and control the people who vote for the guy who wins. Obama wins. He gets to tax everyone who voted for Obama. Voter and voting would go down the. None. <laughs> people vote because they want to tax and control other people, and they believe that they have the moral right to do it by way of politics. They don't want to do it on their own, because then they take on the risk, they feel responsible, and they might even feel bad about it, because they know that's not a thing that moral human beings do. But gosh, if I can run off and press a secret button in a booth and nobody even sees me to tell some guy to steal his money and give it to me, yeah, I'll do that. That's our system. That's democracy. You now it's mass theft and immoral stupidity. But as long as people believe in that, they will all be all want to be first in line to beg the rulers to impose their values 
all the rest of humanity because the malware in their head says that's okay. And says anybody who disobeys or doesn't pay, they're the bad guys. I voted fair and square for that guy to tell you how you can live and take your money. And if you don't pay up, well, you're bad and you deserve whatever happens to you. And I got a front row seat of that. For those who don't know, I spent a year in a cage for not sending pieces of paper to the IRS. Uh, not tax evasion, just misdemeanor, willful failure to file. And 12 people decided, well, if you don't send pieces of paper to a huge bureaucracy, obviously you belong in a cage. So I sat in a cage for a year and wrote two and a half books and some other stuff. Uh, it, it was... It was only pretend prison. It was minimum security where, you know, nobody makes a movie about minimum security prison because it's just boring as sin. No fights, no gang warfare, thankfully so. I'll take boring over fear of death any day. So. It was stupid, but not that scary. But the fact that 12 people, normal people, good people, I'll even say good people. I have to bite my tongue, but I'll say 12 good people because of the malware in their heads, thought I should be stuck in a cage because I didn't send pieces of paper to a bureaucracy. I won't call them sane, but I will call them good. That is why that's what has to be, that's what has to fix. They're coming to get you. I have to send your taxes in <laughs> Well, now I have this brilliant tactic of being way too darn poor to owe them anything, which they know. It does kind of have some drawbacks, but for a while that's been working for me. <laughs> Not that I'd recommend it to everybody, but... Imagine you're down south in the U.S. a couple hundred years ago, and there's a big cotton plantation and there are a bunch of slaves. Now, you have two options. You can go to the slave master and say, this is wrong and you should free them. Now, the mental malware in his head says, this is legal, this is what's done, this is normal, this is how things are, and gosh, it sure helps me. I can sit on my butt and get rich without having to do anything. He has a huge incentive to not face the reality that what he's doing is evil. So you can go whine at him all you want. He's probably not going to change. Um... It might be worth the try anyway, just in case. And it's nice for somebody to give him the chance to take the moral way out. The problem on that plantation primarily is not the master. If you went to the slaves, now, it's one thing to hear a white guy say this, so I highly suggest everybody read um, Frederick Douglass's um, autobiography. It's actually a bunch of writings where he describes the fact that a lot of the slaves thought they were supposed to be slaves. They thought, this is how it is. This is legitimate. We're his property. To such a degree that they would actually view a runaway slave as a thief. You stole yourself from the master. <laughs> and it's weird, and it's funny, and it's evil, and it's depressing. But they really thought that. And for those who don't know, Frederick Douglass was a slave for many years. And what really impresses me wasn't his physical escape that he eventually did. It was the mental escape he did after having had mental malware smashed into his head from the day he was born that says, you're the property of somebody else. And he figured out, no, I'm not. I own myself. <laughs> and to me, that is the most impressive, amazing thing. And the thing is, he, he escaped up north and he wrote these great things, and a bunch of said, a bunch of people said, a slave couldn't write things that good. Because their impression was a slave is just a, a stupid animal, and he's writing these brilliantly eloquent things. And nicely, his former master says, Yeah, that's him. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. You got bonehead. But Frederick Douglass wrote about the fact that, yeah, there really, there really was that mentality among a lot of slaves that this is how things are and it's legitimate. And that's why they would be the ones to talk to. If you had a time machine, go back. 
to try to convince them, this guy doesn't own you. You own yourselves. This whole establishment, this whole society, this way of looking at reality is completely off. It's completely immoral. It's completely backwards. And the day that you figure out you're not owned by him, how do you think one overweight, lazy, white guy in a stupid looking wig is going to control 50 or 100 healthy slaves who don't think they have the obligation to be there. Mental malware is what kept slavery alive. Now, if one person stands up and says, I don't think I have to serve you, I think this is wrong, he gets tied up and whipped and maybe killed. Just as we see today when it comes to government. If one person says, I don't feel an obligation to, to bow to you or obey you, bad things usually happen to them. But if everyone wakes up and the mental malware is gone from everybody, that's it. That's all you need to do. You don't even have to sneak away in the middle of the night. You just say, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. And when the whole world says to the sociopathic megalomaniacs, eh, we're just not going to listen to you anymore, the end. <laughs> you don't need a revolution. Nothing else has to happen. If people just say, we're not giving you our money, we're not giving you our obedience, Frankly, we don't really care to say any more about it. So, my main theme, if I can get to it, is that if you fix people's perceptions, the world will fix itself. And what makes that uncomfortable is people don't want to question what's inside their own head. It's so fun and it's so energizing to have an external enemy to yell at and condemn, you guys are doing this horrible thing. And, and I'm not saying there aren't nasty, malicious people. There are plenty of them. Lots of them live in Washington, D.C. But I'm saying the problem isn't there. And if the perceptions of all the victims of tyranny, if their perceptions fix, that fixes everything, including, as I said before, their enforcers, their tax collectors, their bureaucrats, their police, their soldiers... They do what they do because they have the same malware stuck in their heads that everyone around them has. They are not all malevolent. They're not genuinely nasty on their own. They do bad stuff because they've been taught to believe that when authority tells you to do bad stuff, you should do bad stuff. So they do. Now, a lot of the time, I, I can sum up pretty much everything I do, which is I go and tell people you should be free, and they tell me, no, I shouldn't. It's <laughs> a little depressing, but there has been progress. Because of that thing, people don't want to know the truth if it means challenging whatever they already assume. And, and so I'll say, uh, you're above the law. You are not bound by the decrees of politicians. You should follow your own conscience and nothing else. And people resist that. No, I, there, there have to be laws. So it, wait, okay. Are you going to go on a killing spree if the politicians <coughs> stop telling you not to? If they say, we're repealing the laws against murder, are you going to be a stupid wild animal or do you just think it's everybody else? And every individual thinks it's everybody else. No, I'll, I'll, I'd be just fine. But we have to have laws and we have to have this. But even telling somebody that you aren't bound by your master, it's just like telling a slave, he is not your owner. I know you were taught that. You are your owner. You always have been. And the lie that anybody else has any claim over your life, when that gets out of your head and the heads of 7 billion other people, then we're in good business. Then we're in good shape. Then we can actually have humanity happen. But people resist, and I confess, I resisted. I was a statist for years and years and years, and I know we have to have limited government that just says, we have to have a, a little defensive ruling class, because I didn't want to question that deeply into my own malware, and take the paradigm of authority entirely, and go, mm, yeah, don't need that anymore. So for me, it took years and years. Now, the good news is I've seen a lot of people uh, do it in days or weeks recently in the thousands too. It's amazing. Um, shameless plug. This has helped some people. The most dangerous superstition. Uh, the most important thing I've ever written. But I don't think it's because of any video, any book, any, anything. I think we're coming to a point where human beings are suddenly, for whatever weird magical reason, 
are able to think about things that they weren't 10 or 20 years ago. You know, I've been a, a voluntarist, anarchist, whatever you want to call it, somebody who realizes that government's bogus, for 16 years now. For the first five years of that, I knew maybe six people who would identify themselves the same way. Now I know at least 6,000. And it's speeding up really fast that for some reason people are able to look at this paradigm. They're able to turn their, their eyes to their own brain and check out their own mental malware and say, yeah, that doesn't match my moral code. It doesn't match my values. It doesn't match what I care about. And that's the key. If we had a world of genuinely malicious, evil people, we're just doomed. I'm just running off in the woods and living somewhere. But we don't. We have a world of people who are mostly somewhat rational, somewhat caring, enough to get along, except for this mental malware. If this one superstition is taken out of their heads, if they can be shown that it goes against what they actually are, against what they actually believe in, against the world they want to see, then we get along fine. The only problem is their perception of reality. It's not they're all malicious. You know, even the jackboot beating the tar out of somebody, all the layers of twisted indoctrination that has made him into that, he didn't start as evil and malicious. Well, some of them kind of seem like they did. <laughs> A lot of them didn't. It's just the malware and what it tends to do to the human brain. When people get rid of the malware, you know, a lot of people say, well, well then what do we do about this and how do we do that? Because people want to hear a master plan. Here is how the whole world will work. Well, I'm not running for emperor of anarchy. I'm going to be in charge of one person when the lie of government collapses. And that's it. Now I can give this one person's suggestions or predictions, but who cares? Like, what we do? There's 7 billion other people. I guarantee any field of thought that I can come up with a suggestion or a prediction of what will happen will be worthless compared to millions of other people saying, well, what if we try this instead? Oh, okay, good, you do it. Your idea is better than mine. But people so want to hear that master plan that they think, well, well, how will this be handled? And so I usually turn it around, if they ask it in the past, it says, be handled by some magical, mystical, giant thing. I said, well, how will you handle it? You'll be in charge of you, I'll be in charge of me, same as seven billion other people, what do you think we should do about you know, protecting ourselves or feeding ourselves or communications or whatever, whatever the topic is? But what it comes down to is when people understand the malware, it goes away. And when it goes away, in enough people, they automatically disobey. Like I said, some people will obey authoritarian you know, jackboots to avoid getting beat up or caged, which is perfectly rational. When everybody understands that everybody understands we are not beholden to these people, you just ignore them. You disobey. In fact, after a certain point, it's not even like disobeying is an act. It's just, oh yeah, there's some weird group of narcissistic sociopaths somewhere who are issuing these commands that apparently we're supposed to care about, but I don't, know, I don't even know if they're still there because nobody cares. <laughs> That's what it would really look like. Even the thing of we're going to go sit in front of their building and disobey. Why would you go to the trouble to go to their building? Disobey in your own home. Seven billion people disobeying on their own property and living their lives ends it. Focusing on it doesn't end it. It keeps it going. It gives it strength. Now, the scary thing is that people don't like the uncertainty of a world in which seven billion people own themselves. Deal with it. Because that is reality. And the solution that people want to that uncertainty is we need a master plan making sure that uh, no, we don't. We need the uncertainty of 7 billion people in charge of their own lives. And as scary as that is, it's really easy to point out examples of how that uncertainty leads to way better things than any master plan ever has or ever will. So don't be scared of chaos and anarchy. Be scared of the guy who says, put me in charge and I will fix the world. He is not your master. You are your master.